Thank you everyone for joining us. Welcome to this latest Duke Media Briefing. I'm Gregory Phillips with Duke Communications. On Wednesday, the US Supreme Court will hear oral arguments in New York State Rifle and Pistol Association Incorporated versus Bruin, the first Second Amendment case to come before the court in more than a decade, during which the ideological composition of the court has shifted significantly. We have three Duke experts with us today to discuss the case, how it could affect the right of Americans to carry firearms outside the home, and the potential impact on gun violence in this country. All three have had their research cited in briefs filed with the court in this very case. With us today is Joseph Bloker. He is a law professor at Duke University whose research includes federal and state constitutional law and the First and Second Amendments. He co-directs the Center for Firearms Law at Duke Law School and studies the balance between the rights of individual gun owners and the rights of citizens to conduct their daily business in public without fear of gun violence. Professor Bloker, good morning. Thank you for having me. Also joining us is Daryl Miller. He too is a law professor at Duke and also co-directs the Centre for Firearms Law. His specialties include civil rights, constitutional law and civil procedure, and his scholarship on the Second Amendment has been cited by the US Supreme Court. Professor Miller, good morning to you. Morning, thanks. And we have uh, Jeffrey Swanson. He is a professor in psychiatry and behavioural sciences at the Duke School of Medicine. He studies gun violence from a public health perspective and works on ways to reduce it. He is also a faculty affiliate of the Centre for Firearms Law. Good morning to you, Professor Swanson. Morning, Greg. Okay, Professor Bloker, we'll start with you. Uh, Second Amendment law has changed tremendously in the decades since it was last before the Supreme Court. Um, how has that happened and can you bring us up to speed with that? Sure, I can try to do that. Uh, quickly, um, I think we are really in the midst of a continuing and remarkable transformation in the legal meaning of the Second Amendment. Um, when we talk about constitutional rights, generally what we're trying to figure out is what limits do they place on government's authority to regulate, whether it's, you know, what limits does the First Amendment put on the government's uh, ability to regulate uh, speech-related conduct, for example. When it comes to the Second Amendment, for the vast majority of American history, in fact, for more than two centuries, the answer was it places basically no limits, um, because courts had overwhelmingly interpreted the Second Amendment as being limited just to people and arms and activities that have some connection to the organized militia, the sort of well-regulated militia referred to in the first clause of the amendment. But that changed in 2008 um, with a uh, really landmark Supreme Court decision uh, in District of Columbia versus Heller, uh, still the sort of foundational case for Second Amendment uh, doctrine, at least up until now. And in that case, the court held that, no, the Second Amendment also includes a right to keep and bear arms for certain private purposes, like, for example, the possession of a handgun in the home for self-defense. The court also, and this part is really important, <clears throat> emphasized that that right is still subject to various forms of regulation. And in fact, the court went, went on at length to say uh, uh, that nothing, in our opinion, should cast out on such long standing restrictions as, for example, laws possess, uh, laws forbidding possession of firearms by firearm, uh, by, by people convicted of felonies or in sensitive places like schools and government buildings or of dangerous and unusual weapons and so on. Since Heller, the main project in the courts has been to figure out, and now we've seen probably 1500 cases in the last 13 years, to figure out what forms of regulation are consistent with the right that Heller recognized. And uh, you know, we can talk maybe about sort of the doctrinal intricacies there and how they've led us up to, to this particular case. That's kind of where the, the lay of the land is. I, I guess I would add one other thing, which is that although the vast majority of Second Amendment challenges since Heller have failed, that is most gun regulations have been upheld against Second Amendment challenges, Many states have chosen to deregulate guns in various ways that the Constitution does not specifically require. So, for example, in the late 1980s, only one state uh, allowed you to carry a gun concealed in public without a permit. Now, 21 states do that. That's not because the Second Amendment requires it as, as a matter of any kind of court holding, but we are seeing the sort of remarkable statutory transformation happening alongside the constitutional transformation. Sure, absolutely. Thanks for that background. Uh, Professor Miller, can you tell us a little bit about what this case is about and what makes it so significant? Sure. So uh, this case is actually significant for a couple of reasons. And I think it's fair to say that this uh, case, uh, it started out as uh, New York uh, State Rifle and Pistol Association versus Corlett that got changed to uh, Bruin. Um, really is the case that uh, I think gun rights advocates have been waiting on for over a decade. So as my colleague Joseph said um, in 2008, uh, for the first time, the Supreme Court of the United States held that you could have a gun in your home for personal purposes um, like uh, self-defense, um, but uh, unrelated to one's participation in an organized militia. Uh, but um, the Supreme Court really hasn't heard directly a Second Amendment case uh, since that time, um, or at least uh, since it's uh, a few follow on cases uh, like McDonald versus um, City of Chicago, which applied the Second Amendment 
to the states. So I think this is the case that gun rights advocates have been really waiting on. And at, at issue in this case is one of the many open questions that were left in the uh, uh, District of Columbia versus Heller case, uh, and an important one, which is uh, under what circumstances can a person uh, carry a firearm uh, off his uh, or her property um, and under what conditions. Uh, that case uh, was not directly presented in uh, the Heller opinion. That Heller opinion was mostly about uh, licenses for guns uh, in the home. Um, and uh, the court basically said it would decide these other issues like um, you know, how far you can carry the gun, what kind of guns are protected in subsequent litigation. And this is the first of what I imagine will be um, maybe a series of uh, new cases that are going to um, open up the doctrine. So in uh, this particular case, it has to do with a permitting uh, regimen in the state of New York. Uh, New York has uh, what's known as a, uh, a uh, proper cause standard for uh, getting a concealed carry uh, or carry permit uh, in, um, to carry uh, firearms on, on, on a person, like a pistol on your person, uh, when you're in the streets of, of New York. Um, this is part of a uh, larger uh, set of um, licensing regimes um, nationwide that fall into two camps. One is like New York, uh, which are sometimes known as uh, May issue, where there is some discretion uh, for the licensing authority to um, uh, issue licenses. So in New York, you have to show some sort of proper cause, which the statute doesn't define, but it essentially says that you have to show some sort of need for self-protection um, demonstrable that's different than uh, the general communities or uh, persons engaged in the same profession. This is a May issue uh, regime. This allows some kind of discretion on the part of the licensing authority to deny a license. This is contrasted with something that's known as shall issue, uh, where all you have to demonstrate is that you meet some sort of requirements to uh, possess a gun at all, uh, typically not be a felon, that you've passed a background check, uh, and there is no discretion on the licensing authority to issue such a license. So um, why does it matter? Um, well, as a practical matter, um, what this would mean if the court ends up uh, holding um, that, uh, that the uh, may issue regimen in New York is unconstitutional is that will impact uh, those states um, that have may issue uh, permitting schemes, states like California, uh, New York, Hawaii, uh, New Jersey, uh, Maryland. It's not that um, it's a, a big number of states, but it's a number of states that have um, large populations and large concentrated populations in urban areas. And so it might affect uh, up to 80 million people uh, if, in fact, uh, New York uh, law on uh, May issue is changed. There's also a, an important, I think, uh, what might be thought of as a technical but a sleeper issue uh, that uh, Professor Bloker and I and I think others that are in this area are really paying attention to. And that is, how does a court go about answering a Second Amendment question? To date, uh, what the lower courts have done is uh, what's known as a kind of conventional two-part framework. The two-part framework first asks a question about, are we even dealing with a Second Amendment issue at all? And if so, then it moves to the second portion uh, of the test, uh, which essentially allows uh, for some sort of government proof about why um, their regulation is put forward. Um, and uh, usually it's some sort of um, uh, public policy or criminological or some sort of other data. Uh, but that is not the only uh, mechanism for evaluating Second Amendment cases. And um, Justice uh, Kavanaugh uh, has been at the vanguard when he was a judge in the D.C. Circuit of uh, an alternative approach, which is known as text, history, and tradition only. Uh, and this uh, uh, is not a, uh, a test that asks, you know, um, how reasonable is the fit between the regulation? How much does it uh, impact um, gun rights? You know, what is the justification for it? But instead does something that says, what kind of regulations are traditional or existed in 1791? And does a modern regulation look in some way like that? Why this is a big issue is first, it would essentially put the Second Amendment in terms of all personal rights 
um, in a different category of analysis than we usually think of as uh, for other uh, individual rights. And two, uh, it has the effect uh, potentially of uh, opening up um, a whole lot of other questions um, that we're not sure how they'd be answered by a text history and tradition only approach. That is, uh, how does one examine the legality of an AR-15 or personal owning of large capacity magazines or prohibitions <laughs> on firearms in uh, the uh, airplanes, for example? Um, all these questions are, uh, um, are based on existing regulations, um, but we don't have a good sense about how the text history and tradition only approach would apply. And the final point um, before we move on is this doesn't necessarily mean that even if the court adopted this text history and tradition approach that a lot of regulation would be thrown out, just as Kavanaugh himself said that there is a lot of historical regulation. I think it's just that the analysis would not only be different, um, and, uh, but it might actually be more difficult to sort of suss out the reasoning for answering the hard cases like guns and airplanes rather than the easy cases like, you know, guns, um, you know, in the in the White House, for example. Sure, absolutely. Thank you very much for that uh, comprehensive opening. We're certainly going to dig into all of those things. And right now, I'd like to move on to you, Professor Swanson. You study gun violence, as we've mentioned, from a public history perspective. Obviously, we don't know what the ruling is going to be, but can you talk a little bit about what the potential impact could be based on what, you know, what ruling we might get um, in some of the states where regulation could be affected? Yeah, it's a really interesting what if. And uh, if the uh, decision were to change the entire methodology for deciding, you know, Second Amendment uh, jurisprudence, I think that's anybody's guess. Although, you know, it's worth thinking that if that were to happen, it would really probably narrow the door through which you can bring in research evidence as a as a kind of a deciding factor there. Um, but if we want to think about how a decision could affect the rates of gun violence in our country, um, let's imagine a, a pretty broad decision that would overturn uh, New York's law, you know, and that, let's say that would eventually mean that every state becomes a, uh, a, a shall issue state or a right to carry state. And no state can have a, a discretionary permitting scheme for deciding, you know, who gets a carry gun and who doesn't. Well, it turns out that researchers have studied pretty extensively, and I think there's a, a, a pretty good consensus, you know, maybe t 10 or so uh, uh, peer-reviewed journal articles on the effects of right to carry laws. And one of the best, I think, is by uh, our, our colleague, John Donahue uh, at uh, Stanford in 2019. And um, what his study showed is that uh, when a right to carry law is passed, it results in about a 13 to 15% increase in violent crime. Uh, as a subset of that, you could look at homicides. There's, just, there's a 2017 study out of Boston University that showed that the, the shall issue laws were significantly associated with higher handgun homicide rates, 11% by their, uh, by their reckoning. Um, and then there's a, a, a RAND study that actually included suicide deaths in that, death, uh, gun suicides. And that uh, estimated about a 3%. So it's a little bit, you know, there's some differences here in the estimate, but it's pretty clear that, um, you know, um, and I don't think it's, you don't have to, you don't have to, be a professor to figure out why. I mean, if the state says that you have the right to walk around in the community with a handgun in your pocket, more people are going to do that. If the state can't exercise discretion in saying who is going to get to carry a gun, um, you're going to have a broader range of people, including more who engage in risky behavior, who are carrying a gun, more, more people say with uh, impulsive anger traits. Um, you know, and we, we've studied that in some of our research. I mean, you know, there's probably about, uh, when we did our study, 9% um, of the adults in this country have impulsive, angry behavior. This is, this is, they're the kind of people that are really short fuse. And when they get angry, they break and smash things and they have access to guns. A few of them are carrying guns, but it's probably more now than when we did our study, because we've really seen a an exponential uh, increase in the number of Americans who, are, who have concealed carry permits. And people sometimes use exponential, you know, as a hyperbole. But in this case, it's actually the mathematical function. You'd see this curve. Uh, one study shows an 80 percent increase just since about 2014. And there are a lot of factors for that. But right to carry is probably one of them. 
uh, you know, when the private ownership of guns is kind of baked into our culture and you have messages that we need more guns and hence more people to protect ourselves, even though the research suggests kind of the opposite. And so during the same period, you know, we've seen an uptick in the rate of firearm homicides, uh, specifically about 30 percent just over the past five years ago. The, the non-firearm homicide rate hasn't done that. So what's happened is that the proportion of homicides that involve guns in these recent years is, 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 is increased. So for, from 2014, it was like 64%. In 2020, estimates are at 77%. So you can have the same or the even a declining number of violent acts, so the same level of injurious behavior out there. But if, if more of those acts involve guns, mm. more people are going to die. And if states can't restrict gun carrying to anybody unless they have a felony record or, or they've been involuntarily committed to a psychiatric hospital, you're just going to have a lot more risky people with guns and then you're going to have more fatalities. Sure, absolutely. Thank you. Uh, I appreciate all of our panelists for those opening answers. Uh, we're going to open it up to questions now. Uh, you can post questions in the, uh, thanks to everybody who submit questions in advance, but you can, uh, you can also post questions via the Q&A window at any time. If you'd like to ask a question in person, raise your hand in Zoom and we'll unmute you when your turn comes around. If you're calling in by phone, you can raise your hand by pressing star nine. Thanks also to everyone watching on YouTube. Um, Professor Bloker, I'll come back to you and Professor Miller, I'd welcome you to weigh in on this as well. Obviously the composition of the court has changed significantly since the last time uh, that they heard a second amendment case. Um, what do we know about the um, the way that the what is what is the the way that the newer justices on the court have ruled in past cases? Do they give us any inkling as to how they might rule this time? And uh, I know nobody likes to use a crystal ball, but I'm wondering what history might tell us about what we can expect um, out of this case. Well, we, we know more about some than about others. Um, we do a fair bit about uh, Justices Kavanaugh and Barrett uh, because they both wrote prominent dissenting opinions on the federal courts of appeals before they were elevated to the Supreme Court. So the thing that we know most about them has to do with sort of methodology, again, sort of the point that Professor Miller was making earlier about how the court might evaluate other gun laws going forward under the Second Amendment, not specifically about um, the, the kind of law that's before the court right now, this public carry restriction. Um, but what Justice then Judge Kavanaugh is best known for is our articulating uh, this test of text, history, and tradition, which Professor Miller was describing, which would evaluate the constitutionality of gun laws based solely on those three things, text, history, tradition, or when those run out based on analogy uh, to prior, uh, prior historical enactments. Um, so I think we will all be looking for uh, at oral argument on Wednesday if he asks questions or um, makes comments that suggest, of course, he would, he would favor the adoption of a test like that. Uh, Justice Barrett, uh, then judge on the Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals, wrote uh, a prominent dissenting opinion in which he also took an historical approach, although not, not identical to the one I think that, um, uh, that Kavanaugh had articulated in his opinion for, for the D.C. Circuit. So for those two, we know, um, you know both that they issued these decisions adopting historical tests, also that in both of those cases they were ruling in favor, they would have ruled in favor of a gun, a gun rights claim. Um, so I think we can suspect, at least for them, um, uh, maybe some sympathy for the petitioners, but certainly for the, um, uh, for the methodology um, uh, based on history. You know, the, the fact that the court has changed as much as it has, um, it certainly portends changes to the way the Second Amendment, I think, will be interpreted and applied going forward. Uh, Heller, the case I was mentioning earlier from 2008, was a deeply divided five to four decision. Um, for a long time after that, the Supreme Court basically stayed away. As soon as um, the Trump appointees started to become confirmed, the courts developed an appetite for taking Second Amendment cases again um, and started in short order granting um, uh, uh, argument in these cases, one uh, which disappeared because the law that was being challenged um, uh, was um, uh, was taken off the books and so the case became moot. Um, this is like really our first chance, I think, to see the reconstituted court in action. Sure, thank you. And Professor Miller, as a, as a follow-up to that, you um, explained uh, Justice Kavanaugh's support of this text history and tradition approach. Um, is there any sense of how much traction that might have gotten or might get with the other justices on the court? Could we see that becoming a, a, a kind of a, a dominant way of at least looking at Second Amendment cases, do you think? Yeah, well, you know, it, it raises a couple of really interesting questions, which is um, the one is to what extent does like a, you know, a five justice majority sort of bind future courts to a specific methodology. So that's a, it's kind of an inside baseball issue, but um, assuming that um, the court would be loath to, um, uh, you know, to say we do text history and tradition only with second amendment cases and then have a, uh, some, a portion of that majority sort of peel off at, at the later point. 
um, I think it's I, I think it's fair to say that um, you know thinking about the methodology here, uh, as just uh, you know, as, as uh, uh, Professor Bloker said, um, you know we have two or three people that we can say are, are really on board with it. Um, in other areas, um, uh, Fourth Amendment jurisprudence, for example, I, uh, I've seen uh, some hesitancy from Justice Alito, for example, of adopting um, this text history and tradition and analogies there from um, in a famous case about um, uh, placing a GPS on a vehicle to uh, uh, as a search. Uh, um, uh, he parted ways with Justice uh, Scalia on whether it made sense to sort of try to think about this in terms of analogies to constables, you know, riding in vehicles or not. You know, he said something sort of witty about it would have to be a very small constable or something like that. So I think he's indicated at least some reluctance to totally buy uh, the text history and tradition only approach. Um, and so we might end up very much with a fragmented opinion, uh, at least on methodology. We could have, um, you know, a majority in terms of an outcome, uh, but some disagreement anticipating the next case and the next case on how the court actually uh, is supposed to resolve these particular uh, hard cases. Gotcha. Thank you. And, and I want to kind of uh, step outside the courtroom just for a minute and come back to you, Professor Swanson, because obviously the concerns of a lot of non-legal people as we watch these hearings is about gun violence and the potential impact. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about how gun violence actually breaks down in this country, because obviously people get very upset when there are mass shootings, but um, the mass shootings obviously don't necessarily uh, account encompass most of the gun violence in this country. So how does it actually break down based on your research? Sure. Let me start with just a big picture here. So since the year 2000, more than 2 million people have been injured or killed in gunfire in the United States and around 700,000 have died. And you know, that's a bigger number than the entire US military combat death toll from all of our wars combined, you know, from the American Revolution to, to Afghanistan. Um, in 200, 2019, that's most re recent year we have these data, we average 109 gun deaths per day on average. That's a rate of about 12 per 100,000. And the majority of those gun fatalities, some, uh, some people are surprised to learn, are suicides. 59% were suicides, 37% were homicides, and then the remaining 4% um, is kind of sliced up between unintentional shootings and police actions and you know somewhere we just don't know what the intent was. Now there's a tiny fraction of the homicides, just less than one half of 1% are what you could call public mass shooting victims. So there's a, a lone shooter that kills at least four people in a single incident. So if you think about that, on the day of a, of a horrific, horrific mass casualty shooting, that gets so much attention. And I'm not saying they don't deserve all the attention, but a hundred other people die all over this country on that same day and gun suicides and and gang shootings and uh, domestic violence incidents and just, you know, arguments gone bad between young men in the middle of the night and they're angry and, and intoxicated and somebody has a handgun and you've got a fatality or maybe more. And that's very different, by the way, than the situation in, in most of our peer high income countries in Western Europe and the UK and Canada and Australia and Japan. I mean, there, you know, they've kind of decided that, uh, the idea that people should be able to walk around with handguns is just too dangerous. And so they broadly uh, limit that, legally uh, limit uh, access to guns in that way and make exceptions out on the margins. But, uh, you know, so there somebody gets a black eye or a bloody nose. And in our uh, country, just because there are way more guns, it's way more likely that a gun will be involved in that kind of altercation. Um, you know, so that that's that's kind of the kind of the situation in our country. We don't have an exceptionally high crime rate, violent crime rate. We're just sort of average if you look at our peer countries. We have a really exceptional homicide rate. And that's because uh, so so uh, many more of uh, our, our suicides and our, um, and our homicides, you know, involve guns. And with suicide, I mean, you know, that's uh, another big part of it. And you know we've done some research and showing that uh, from Florida, for example, that 72% of uh, of um, gun uh, suicide decedents um, could have passed a background check on the day 
they uh, used a gun to end their life and 28% of them were already prohibited. You know, so that's another problem with the implementation and, and, uh, and um, you know, enforcement of the laws that we already have. Sure. And uh, obviously, you know, the, the suicide rate in this country, I think, is, is always a jolt when people hear it because it's higher than people think. Given that this law specifically is involving um, handguns outside the home, do you think that um, uh, the, the impact of a ruling here is going to be more significant on homicides than it is on suicides? Because we tend to think of suicides generally as something that, that happens at home. Or is that a misnomer? No, I think that's right. I think the data such as we have that we can extrapolate from would suggest that's true. And at the same time, if people obtain a handgun, whether it's for personal protection or for any other reason, just to have one, if, they're, if, they, if they have a handgun uh, and they uh, you know, uh, go to the trouble of getting a, a permit uh, to, to have it and concealed or whatever, carry it around, it means that they're gonna have access to it. Um, and you know, when someone um, is in a season of, of, of despair or a moment of hopelessness, um, and that access is there, you know, the, the vast majority of people who attempt suicide in this country survive. We have, you know, about 90% survive, except if they use a gun. If they use a gun, it's just the other way around. They almost never survive, um, you know, because it, uh, it creates catastrophic damage and with very little physical effort. So it's really about access to guns too, when you think broadly um, about, um, because sometimes people get a, a gun for one reason and then it gets used or it might be used by somebody else too. Sure, absolutely, thank you. Uh, Professors Bloker and Miller, um, coming back to the, the Supreme Court case um, that they'll hear arguments on this week. Uh, often going into these things, people, at least people outside of the legal um, realm tend to expect these wide sweeping broad rulings and then often what comes back is is quite narrow do we have any sense um uh, amongst the legal community at least in what we expect might be left unresolved after this case are there large questions that this case could bring up that we just think the court won't address Professor Boker, why don't you go first? I'll go first. Yeah, I think there are lots of different ways the court could go here. Um, and it's actually really hard to handicap precisely because we don't have, unlike in areas like the First Amendment, where we have a rich record of rulings by each of the justices here, we don't have as much of a track record. So it's kind of tough to know what the justices, even if, for example, Justice Kavanaugh, who's skeptical of uh, restrictions on um, so-called assault weapons, um, what he, whether how he translates that to public carry is really tough to know. Um, this is just one one of the many, 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 many kinds of gun laws out there, and the court might say yes, this kind of public carry restriction is unconstitutional. But um, as the court did in Heller, it may say that other forms of regulation, whether it's you know prohibiting possession by people who've been adjudicated mentally ill or involuntarily committed, those are fine. Um, now. The hard question, and this is why I think um, uh, Professor Miller and I are so focused on the methodology here, the hard question is really like, what's the reasoning? Like, like on what basis does the court rule? Because that's what'll tell us how might they rule in other cases or how lower courts might have to rule in other cases involving, uh, involving gun challenges. I mean, it's entirely possible even in this case that the court might say, um, you know, New York has this proper cause requirement. Those are not categorically unconstitutional. It is okay to make people show proper cause before they carry a concealed gun in public. But this proper cause requirement is too stringent. You got to make it easier. And then maybe this course, this case gets sent back down for New York to uh, to revise its revise its rule, or for that matter, for the court to learn a little more about exactly how this. Uh, law is being applied because the parties in this case, New York and the challengers, disagree about how many people are getting permits. We know that the two petitioners in this case didn't get the permits they wanted, but is that evidence of a trend or not? Is it itself a, a disputed proposition? So there's there's really, really many different ways it could go, and it kind of depends on which coalitions form uh, among the justices. Yeah, I, uh, and I, I think it's, it's worthwhile to mention that um, on the sort of narrowness or broadness that the, the court, the, the, the litigants wanted a fairly broad question to be answered about carrying firearms outside the home and whether that was you know, constitutionally required or not. And for reasons that still remain somewhat obscure, the, the Supreme Court actually narrowed the question that they were asking which to this, which is whether the state's denial of petitioners' applications for concealed carry licenses for self-defense violated Second Amendment. So it's an opportunity if the court wanted to rule really narrowly to do so. Um, you know, before we sort of move off to the next question, I think the impact, we have to take into account the impact that Professor Bloker was saying, which is a lot of the action about gun rights is not actually happening in the Supreme Court. It's happening in legislatures. It's happening in uh, state 
uh, state houses uh, across the nation. And it would be an incredible boon uh, for those that believe in a fairly unfettered right to carry firearms for the court to end up ruling that um, that the uh, right to uh, keep and bear arms includes a uh, very relaxed idea about being able to carry it in the home. It will put enormous pressure uh, on other kinds of regulatory devices like training requirements. Some states don't even require any training at all to carry a pistol outside the home. Um, it will put incredible uh, pressure on other areas of the doctrine, like what's known as the sensitive places doctrine, uh, which is guns uh, can't be carried in schools or government buildings and some other ill-defined set of sensitive places. But if you have more people carrying more guns in more places, um, then, you know, daycare centers and hospitals and other um, uh, folks are going to want to know, uh, am I a sensitive place? Um, so uh, even a fairly narrow ruling could have a, a, an incredible amount of, I think, political significance. Sure. Thank you both. And I'm glad you brought up the legislative angle, because a question I had for you is that, you know, we always say, regardless of what the rulings are in cases like these, there's a legislative reaction. As you've said, if, if, uh, if this court were, if this rule were to be um, overturned and found to be unconstitutional, there would be an impact. But I'm wondering if, for example, this, uh, this law was found to be unconstitutional, as you say, would pr place pressure on these other doctrines. But then in the shall issue states where you said, you know, they, they people may have to pass a background check and not be a felon. Could, is it possible that states could, um, the states that want to exert more control over gun ownership, could try and add um, aspects to a shall issue in the sense of, okay, you, you can't be a felon, um, you must pass a background check. Could they try and um, uh, make those background checks more stringent as a way of imposing more checks? Or does that mean that um, even shall issue requirements could come under more scrutiny um, if, if, if there's a push for more unfettered gun ownership? Does that make sense? Yeah, I think so. I, it, it's a little hard to tell. Um, I mean, it kind of depends on what the ruling is. Um, you know, to the extent that you had some sort of broad statement about shall issue, um, and then you started sort of as a legislative matter tweaking the, um, you know, what entitles you to a permit in the first place, uh, or even to possess a gun, that, that might be problematic because uh, we already have a, an opinion about, you know, the bare um, requirements to actually possess a weapon. I mean, they're not fully fleshed out. We don't know, for example, whether it's unconstitutional for people that are um, 18 to 21 year olds to, you know, to go in and purchase firearms. We don't know how low the bar is uh, or can be set in terms of age requirements. Um, I think the more uh, pressing issue in a, uh, in a world in which shall issue is the law of the land will be things like training. Like I said, uh, many states that have um, permitless carry or so-called constitutional carry don't require any training at all. And so you're um, in an environment in which um, private parties are authorized uh, to carry guns uh, on their person and potentially deploy lethal force uh, in, under circumstances um, in which the training level is far less than what we would expect of a police officer, for example. Uh, as I said, I think it will really put a lot of pressure on the sensitive places doctrine. Like, um, uh, you know, uh, will will uh, uh, localities or states be able to say um, not only the government building, but a hundred, you know, a hundred feet around it, or two hundred feet, or parking lots in uh, government buildings, or daycare centers, or hospitals? Those are also also uh, what we might think of as. Um, as a sensitive place sort of creating, if you're a gun rights advocate, a kind of gauntlet that you have to figure out about where you can carry the gun. Um, so there's a lot of permutations in terms of where the court, uh, excuse me, where the legislatures would react uh, if in fact um, Bruin comes down to say that there has to be um, a kind of shall issue regime nationwide. Thank you. And Professor Bloker, I wanted to come back to you briefly because you mentioned, as Professor Miller had, this uh, proper cause thing that's an issue here. And you mentioned that the court may come back and find that it's been applied too stringently. But yet, of course, we know that it's undefined. So what can we say about how New York has applied this proper cause um, uh, aspect and, and what might come out of that? But I mean, how, how has it been so stringently applied when it's not actually defined? I guess they must be using some sort of subjective definition, right? Well, it, it, the statute itself doesn't define what counts as proper cause, but the New York courts have looked at the 
this and the way that the New York courts have applied, and I think Professor Muriel might have mentioned this in, in passing earlier, is that proper cause means a person has to, and I'm quoting here from a case, demonstrate a special need for self-protection distinguishable from that of the general community or if persons engaged in the same profession. So it's not just enough to say, I want to have a gun because I think that will make me feel safer. Um, there usually has to be something, presumably, that you point to to say, you know, I, um, I've been, I, I've been threatened. I have a stalker. I, uh, I transport money regularly as part of my job. In fact, one of the two petitioners in this case has a permit to carry a gun to and from work, just not in other uh, other populated areas. It's the unrestricted form of the permit that they um, that they want. Maybe that's worth emphasizing here. There are actually different kinds of public carry permits one can get in the state of New York: unrestricted and restricted. The unrestricted permit is the one we're talking about. That is, when you have that, you can go almost any place, not necessarily schools and government buildings, but generally into, for example, New York City. What these petitioners got are restricted licenses, meaning they can carry handguns for things like hunting and recreation, and in one case, to and from work. They want to be able to do it in sort of more, more contexts um, the, than that. Now, it could well be that, you know, the, the spin on this has to be that proper cause is more specifically defined and defined in ways that are quote unquote objective, such that this regime starts to look more like a, uh, if you like, shall issue, just with a higher standard for what um, constitutes the shall issue trigger. Um, but, the, but a lot of that, you know, as I say, is disputed between the parties. They really deeply disagree about the rate at which these permits are being granted, about how people can get them, uh, uh, and so on. So if the court gets stuck up on that question, then I think the right solution would be to send the case back down um, for actual fact finding. This case came up really without a whole lot of briefing on those kinds of issues. And so if the, if the justices are interested in that issue, they may actually have to not punt this, but send it back down to, to, to learn more. Sure, absolutely. Thank you. And Professor Swanson, since we're talking about this, this uh, proper cause aspect, does your research show anything about how much of a difference um, these kind of uh, requirements can make in when, once you get to the sharp end of, of homicide and suicide rates, since we often find cases in which somebody's involved in a homicide and there was no suggestion that, you know, they legally had permits, there weren't any issues kind of previously, but do we find that these kind of regulations can actually help reduce gun violence when they're in place? Yeah, so it, it, it's an interesting question uh, and, and it, it probably varies uh, quite a bit from state to state. Um, I'll answer it by saying that, um, you know, we've put a lot of emphasis in the past on the, the regulations at the point of sale. So what are the criteria that it goes into a background check you know, under, the, under the Brady law that someone has to pass? And, you know, as you've heard, those are things like you have to not have a felony conviction or, or uh, um, you know, a, a mental health related adjudication. And, you know, we've, we've got, um, evidence in some states that, that those actually do um, reduce violent crime because they reduce the, the access that someone's going to be able to have it. On the other hand, when you think about it, um, we have a very robust uh, legal, uh, Ill illegal or secondary gun market in this country. So, um, you know, the fact is that, that uh, the majority in some states, it's a larger majority than elsewhere, of people who end up uh, being arrested and convicted for a violent crime, a, a homicide, for example, uh, in our particular study in, in Connecticut, I mean, in, in, in Florida, it was 67% of those individuals were already prohibited from possessing a gun and they got one anyway. Um, so when you think about gun violence prevention, it isn't just one law, you know, what's the one thing we should do? It's really a, it's really a puzzle. Um, and we need to do a lot of things. I mean, you know, we could have better criteria at the point of sale, and, and many states have, have done that. Um, probably the majority of people in, in, in live, now live in states with stronger, uh, and I would say arguably more sensible gun laws than was the case during the Sandy Hook uh, Elementary School shooting. Um, and so there's a lot happening at the state um, level. Um, you know, but uh, it, it, those re regulations would work a lot better if we had universal comprehensive background checks where everybody had to go through a background check. And of course, the, the criteria are probably always gonna be if they're categorical, too broad and too narrow. There are people who are going to be prohibited from purchasing, possessing guns um, who are never gonna be violent. Maybe they had a, a remote, uh, you know, short involuntary commitment for a, a brief reactive depression or something many years ago, and now they're not dangerous, but they still can't buy a gun. On the other hand, you have 
many people who actually do pose a risk and they're not prohibited. They would pass a background check. Uh, in some states, for example, violent misdemeanors, people who have a history of a violent crime, but it's not a felony, so they can buy a gun. Some states, California does prohibit from violent guns from, from uh, violent misdemeanors. Um, so all of these things, you know, we, we, we probably need a scheme in our country and many states to have this now 18, where there is a risk-based um, temporary uh, fire removal law that that uh, that is nimble enough to respond to people who are maybe dangerous at a particular time could be you know your granddad who's bereaved and has 12 shotguns and hasn't committed a crime isn't mentally incompetent it's not criminally accused so you know it's a, gun violence is a complicated uh, problem caused by many many things and the solution is also uh, complex uh, and let me leave it at that for now Sure. Thank you very much. Um, Professor Bloker, I want to come back to you. There's obviously a lot of fascinating inside baseball stuff with this Supreme Court case for, for yourself and, and Professor Miller. What I'm wondering is for, for those of us who um, you know, are not well versed in the legal issues, as we watch uh, the arguments and we wonder about ruling, what should people really be paying attention to? You know, the, those, those kind of non-legal scholars that are looking at this, what do you think is, is uh, what, what are the gold coins that we should be really be looking at where the, where the real interest is in this case for your regular American? Well, kudos to anybody who's not a lawyer who's watching the oral arguments, um, because this will be a lot of inside baseball. But anybody who's watching or listening, um, there are a couple of things that at least there will be um, on, on our radar. I mean, one is to see what the new members of the court is new since the last time the court has heard a Second Amendment case. What questions they ask? What do they say? I think that's, you know, particularly for Justices Kavanaugh and Gorsuch and Barrett, uh, just sort of see where are they tipping their hand. We may hear questions from Justice Thomas, uh, who's sort of famously um, quiet in most oral arguments, but feels apparently very strongly about this issue and has issued a series of uh, decisions from the court's denial of other Second Amendment cases, suggesting kind of where he is. Um, I think we should see, see some potentially really interesting moments with that if he chooses to ask a, chooses to ask a question. Um, again, it's sort of just knocking off, you know, sort of go, going down the line of justices on the court. Um, Justice Alito will be an interesting to watch. Um, he is a reliably conservative vote, um, one of the more conservative, more reliably more conservative votes on the court uh, really in decades. Um, but he's also a former prosecutor uh, who presumably has some sympathy for federal gun laws, uh, including one of some of those that we've just been discussing here, the federal law prohibiting people uh, who've been convicted of felonies for possessing guns, or for that matter, people adjudicated mentally ill, people convicted of domestic violence crimes, right? Is he going to try to come up with a solution here that would allow him to strike down New York's law, but preserve those kind of federal laws that he was once um, tasked with enforcing as prosecutor? Um, there'll be a lot of sort of interesting, you know, um, court dynamics, which even if you're not into like, you know, citing the cases back and forth, I think will be interesting to follow along with. To sort of zoom out, zoom out, how should people be thinking about this case? I mean, the way I think about it, which I think is, is probably the way most people will encounter this question, um, which after all is about the use of guns in public places, is that this is really kind of playing out against the backdrop of our sort of collectively wrestling with the place, and I mean, actual physical place as well as metaphorical place of guns in American society. Um, and that has changed uh, in ways significant, I think, since even the Heller case was decided. You know, Professor Swanson, I think earlier was trying to like make be very concrete for us, like these are the, these are, this is the physical toll that we're dealing with. I think people have a hard time even understanding just the casualty count, the number of, of bodies hit by bullets. But if we think more broadly, even more broadly than that, the sort of harms of, you know, that guns can inflict go, go well beyond even the number of people who are, for example, killed in a school shooting or who are, um, you know, killed by <clears throat> a partner. Uh, and it includes ways in which guns are used in public places or for that matter, private places to coerce, to terrify, to intimidate, um, also certainly to protect, but to try to balance out and under, understand and come to grips with those kind of non-physical costs and benefits, I think is, is, is something that everybody intuitively maybe gets that this is about more than just bodies and bullets, um, but it's kind of hard to make maybe hard to make concrete, um, but I think really is deserving of more attention. And, and some of the newest research that's coming out has to do with how many people are deterred from peaceably assembling, from worshiping, from voting for that matter, from speaking, because they're worried about um, uh, the possibility of, uh, of gun violence. And that, that to me is sort of where I think a lot of people are intuitively, but also where the conversation is that we'll be watching that's sort of in the inside baseball. 
Yeah, sure. I'm glad you brought that up because I know uh, some of your recent work especially looks at this tension between the First and Second Amendments, right? You've got people, especially, you know, we, we've got a very politically active society right now. We're divided. People want to demonstrate. But we've seen um, cases in which people have maybe been intimidated from the idea of protest because of the potential of counter protesters who are heavily armed. So do you think that that's something um, that this tension between First and Second Amendments is something we could see coming before the courts? Do you think that the Second Amendment will have to be grappled with in terms of its tension with the First Amendment? You know, how it will present itself legally is actually kind of a tricky question because, you know, when we say that the First and Second Amendment are coming into conflict, technically no, because there are only both of them limitations on the government acting. So like if one person intimidates another one with a gun, even if that keeps person B from speaking, it's not a First Amendment issue because the first person is not a government actor. It might be a tort, it might be a crime, but it's not technically sort of a constitutional issue. The way I think it could come up is through civil lawsuits, which some of which we're seeing already, for example, in the wake of the of the, uh, of the Charlottesville riot. Um, there may be similar follow-on suits in places like, what, pick your place. Um, there are lots of armed public assemblies these days, which are governed by law, both, um, both, both civil and criminal. I think where we'll really see it is not necessarily in court cases so much as in that that sort of continuing public discussion about what kinds of gun laws we want to have in the first place. People standing up in meetings and invoking either their First Amendment rights and interests or their Second Amendment rights and interests or their 14th Amendment rights and interests and asking really elected officials to kind of come up with ways to, to um, uh, I want to say balance, to accommodate them all. Um, there are many people out there who feel more secure carrying a gun into a public place. And they may say, I would, not, I would never go to an assembly if I can't carry my gun. Other people are gonna say, I'm not gonna go to an assembly where there are armed people because I'm worried about the potential for lethal violence. And what we really have to do is kind of just actually come to grips with those competing viewpoints uh, and, and come to understand them. That might happen in litigation. I think it's more likely to happen in public discourse and in, uh, in, in debates about regulation. Sure, thank you. And I want to bounce back to you, Professor Swanson, briefly on that point, because you've also studied, um, you know, the emotional trauma that happens from gun violence, something about, you know, the, the collective fear of living in a heavily armed society. So what, what does your research kind of tell us about that and where we are in America right now? Yeah, and I'm glad you asked that, because it's true. We, you know, we usually think of gun violence in terms of just the number of people who die, but every gun death affects many more people than that. Gun, gun deaths produce this, this ripple effect of, of, of psychological and collective trauma. It just kind of cuts through families and communities and generations. And some of that has to do with just the number of people who are armed out there. Um, there are a couple of interesting studies to mention. One is a, a new study by some researchers at the University of Maryland. And what they did is looked really at the collateral effects of gun violence exposure in four big cities. Um, New York, Philadelphia, Baltimore, and Washington, D.C. And what they found is kind of astonishing that 24% of the adults in those cities had personal knowledge of someone who had died in, in gun violence. And, and that percentage varied a lot, by the way, by race, of the race of the respondents. So 40% of, of Black respondents said they personally knew somebody who had died as a result of a gunshot. It's 28% of Latinx residents and 14% and of white residents. Now, then they went on and they, and this is important, they, they measured uh, you know, in a pretty standardized way, what were the, the, sort of the levels of psychological distress and, and depression and suicidal ideation and even psychotic-like experiences. And what they found is that the people who were exposed in the sense that they, they personally knew someone who died had significantly higher scores on those uh, on those mental health uh, measures, about on average 20% higher. This is controlling for other kinds of effects and comparing them to their counterparts. Another way of looking at this is is through the lens of an economist. And so, you know, by one health economist reckoning, our our society uh, spends you know, or it costs us actually 280 billion dollars a year gun violence. But you look at how that breaks down. A quarter of it is the sum of costs of, for medical care and policing and criminal justice and employer costs and, and, and work loss and things like that. All the rest of it, 214 billion, is attributed to the loss of quality of life, pain and suffering experienced by people affected by gun violence. So monetize that, right? And um, and then we have, you know, I think Professor Boker re re referred to this. There's a measurable effect on people in the community who are just affected indirectly because they're afraid of gun violence. They're afraid, uh, you know, of mass shootings. And that's about, you know, uh, I think, um, um, you know, there's, there's one study that suggested uh, that 71% of adults have experienced a fear of mass shootings as, as a significant source of stress in their lives. 
And one out of three of them avoid certain places because they're afraid of mass shootings. So that's, even if mass shootings is, is, a, is a, you know, tiny percent of the homicides, it's a huge percent of kind of the people's anxiety, uh, which, you know, you, which you could kind of try to even monetize and measure. Gotcha, thank you very much. Um, Professor Miller, I want to come back to you. Um, there was a federal court ruling in June that California's assault weapons ban was unconstitutional and the ruling likened an AR-15 to a knife. And this is a common thing that comes up, obviously, in discussions of weapons. Do you think that that ruling was an anomaly or does it say something about maybe where we're headed with Second Amendment rulings? Well, I mean, it, it, the, the opinion and the, the judge that wrote it was pilloried um, in, in part because I think he thought he was being clever and it came off as um, um, either foolish or insensitive. Uh, but what he was trying to channel was something that I think is sort of born out of the difficulties of the doctrine that comes from Heller itself. So Heller uh, says that the kinds of weapons that are protected are not uh, quote, dangerous uh, and unusual weapons, but instead weapons that are in common use. But the court never actually offers any kind of metric to figure out what exactly um, the distinction between those two things are. And so what is proliferated uh, as evidenced by this, this judge who talks about, you know, AR-15s mm -hmm. being like um, Swiss Army knives is to talk about mm -hmm. it in terms of, you um, commercial popularity. Um, so you get analogies between, uh, you know, the sales of AR-15s and, um, uh, you know, Ford, Ford um, flatbed trucks or, or, you know, or, or, or knives, um, you know, Swiss army knives or whatever. Um, and so um, the, the problem is that uh, we don't have yet some kind of determinant for what does it mean to be common use? What, what is, as, as um, lawyers like to say, the denominator? What are, what are you comparing it to? Common use as compared to what? Common use as compared to um, all self-defense weapons, common use as uh, uh, compared to actual firearms, common use as compared to uh, rifles, common use as compared to multi-round rifles. Um, there's not any kind of agreed upon metric uh, to determine that. And this is one way in which, for example, the text history and tradition approach may add another layer of complexity or at least um, uncertainty into this uh, question, which is um, a lot of um, uh, people that uh, support uh, constitutional protection, for example, for AR-15s or for large capacity magazines uh, will say, look, this is uh, a, a lineal descendant using language from um, the, uh, the chief justice, a lineal descendant of uh, the musket that existed in 1791. But that, again, presupposes that you're pointing to the right um, uh, unit of analogy. Uh, yeah, they're both firearms, but, um, you know, a, um, a, a modern rifle uh, is uh, anywhere, you know, from uh, 100 to many uh, multiple times as lethal as a, uh, as a musket. So what exactly is the metric that we're using? And so that's why that opinion uses the language it does, um, which is um, infelicitous, um, but it's kind of driven by a, um, um, an uncertainty in terms of how we figure out what common use uh, weapons and common use that are constitutionally protected are. Sure, absolutely. Thank you. Um, we're getting close to time, but I wanted to ask uh, each of you the same question before we wrap up. And um, Professor Bloker, we'll start with you. Um, obviously, we're just about to hear oral arguments in this case, and we won't expect a ruling, I'm guessing, until at least sometime early next year. But what concerns you the most about the potential impact of any particular ruling in this case, not knowing what will happen? It's a great question, Greg. I'll answer um, quickly. Um, as, as I say, the balance, the proper balance of gun rights and regulation is a genuinely complicated question calling for nuanced solutions. We've been talking about some of that already today. It's not just about being for or against gun rights or regulation, but about thinking hard about a whole suite of possible targeted, effective, and constitutional solutions, which I think in the end is going to come down to a combination of things like background checks and extreme risk protection order laws, um, uh, restrictions on particular classes of people, particular classes of weapons, and so on. Uh, and what I worry about most is that the court will unnecessarily restrict the range of uh, the reach of democratic politics in trying to find those solutions. 
Sure, absolutely. And Professor Swanson, same question to you. What's your biggest concern as we wait for a ruling? Well, I'll, I'll answer it as a researcher. You know, I'm, I believe in evidence-based policymaking and evidence-based public law. And um, so I'm most concerned about uh, a change maybe in the methodology of deciding uh, future challenges, uh, you know, in, in the area of the Second Amendment. Um, because if it turns out that it's something resembling the text theory, the history and theory um, uh, method, it, it may mean that, that uh, it, it will severely limit um, evidence-based policymaking. And, you know, we've, we've learned a lot, you know, in the past uh, uh, 10 to 20 years about the causes and consequences of gun violence and what kinds of, of uh, laws can actually save lives. And if we can't implement and apply that, that apply that body of research to decide these questions about whether the government actually does have uh, a compelling interest in a particular legal regime and, and, and also the question of whether it's narrowly tailored. I think that would, that would, uh, that would really um, be a, a real disadvantage in terms of the overall epidemic of gun violence in our country and trying to imagine a world where we would have fewer people dying as a result of a gunshot. Sure, thank you very much. And uh, Professor Biller, same question to you. Yeah, it's a... It's an excellent question. Um, and I guess my answer is somewhat similar to uh, Professor Swanson's, which is, um, you know, the first concern that I have is a ruling that is um, so narrow uh, on the methodology that the um, really important research um, about sort of evidence-based policymaking becomes completely irrelevant. And then we're uh, suddenly um, just sort of mining um, you know, uh, 14th century, 15th century um, textbooks to try to figure out what kind of regulations are constitutional. Uh, the second thing, uh, which is uh, related, is this uh, if, uh, is a concern that if the court does apply a kind of text history and tradition and analogy approach, that it ends up being incredibly one-sided. That is, that we have a uh, forward-looking regime um, that is quite capacious in terms of thinking about analogies at the rights level, but not at the regulations level. So, for instance, um, you know, the court um, has essentially said, look, modern weapons are protected under the Second Amendment, even if they didn't exist in 1791. And therefore, it is a, a Second Amendment question uh, about whether uh, and to what extent AR-15s are, are protected arms. Uh, but then it deploy an incredibly narrow approach on the regulation side and say, oh, I need to see a regulation that looks exactly like a regulation of guns on airplanes. Otherwise, I want to presume that uh, such a regulation is unconstitutional and finding no airplane regulations in 1791, I'm going to hold that's unconstitutional. I think the worst kind of outcome, if in fact the court adopts this sort of text history tradition analogy approach is um, that it's uh, really parsimonious on the regulation side and really capacious at the, uh, at the rights side. Gotcha. Thank you very much. And uh, we'll call it there. Thank you to all of our panelists. Uh, thank you everyone for joining us. Thank you to Joseph Bloker, Daryl Miller and Jeffrey Swanson for sharing your expertise. I think the one thing we can guarantee is when there is a ruling in this case that people will disagree about it. Uh, if you'd like to be notified about other upcoming Duke media briefings, please email dukenews at duke.edu. Or if you're watching YouTube, just like and subscribe. Um, thank you very much for joining us. And please do remember that when uh, doing your research, just like when doing your cooking, it always pays to check your sources. Thank you very much for joining us and have a great day.